have more people coming in here, more people popping in online. We currently have Okay, so we have about 25 online. I expect more. So thanks everyone who could be here in person. Um, I know some people have put in the chat that they intended to come in person, but had to come online. So we're glad that the Sideflex format makes it more likely that everyone is here. Uh, my name is Christina Moore. I'm the Associate Director for the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning. And this is our wonderful student panel. Um, so just as a couple of housekeeping notes, we're recording this session. And in an extra step that we don't always do, we will be posting the video to YouTube per student request. So keep that in mind as we engage in this session. Um, but we have two of us monitoring the chat on Zoom, so we will do our best to, to surface those comments allow people to unmute as needed. If you have a question on Zoom, please use the raise hand um, reaction or just let me know in chat if you want to unmute since we have a big audience today. So how today will look like, and we'll have to manage time pretty carefully because we could talk for a long time. Um, but we will, I'll have Lance, I'll introduce everyone. I'll have Lance Markowitz, who has been leading this event and all the planning. Um, I'll have him do a brief introduction of what this work has looked like leading up to today. We'll pose a few questions for the panel um, and then also invite comments accordingly. We'll open it up to everyone's questions and then we'll wrap up somewhat. Yeah. So I will provide a quick introduction to our panel so that we know who we're talking to. And then I'll have um, Lance share a little bit more about himself. So Lance Markowitz, who is here, if you can do a little a little wave, um, mm -hmm. as I say, so I'm going to see online as well. He's a student Congress legislature specializing in student engagement advocacy, and he has been doing presentations on campus and in similar student governments, um, Michigan University <laughs> organization meetings as well. And he is involved in the next strategic plan. I'll leave it at that since we'll say more. Um, next we have um, Andrew, is it Kadat? Yes. Okay, so Andrew Kadat is an MBA student with a concentration in accounting. Um, he has his philosophy degree from Boston College and he has all sorts of experience in uh, volunteering in India with a non-large profit organization. He's there for 17 years, and then 13 years as a department lead in overseas coordination. And now he is involved as a graduate assistant and the president of the Graduate Business Leader Student Board, and they have a networking meeting next Wednesday. And he's on the Graduate Student Advisory Board. Um, Nina hannah is uh, I know who you are, I'm just trying to be here, is a senior majoring in professional and digital writing. Her academic work explores DEI-related topics within writing studies, and on campus, she is an embedded writing specialist, a peer mentor, and an admissions ambassador, and she's also a published author. And then we have Clarence Sanders, and he is a student coordinator for belonging and acceptance for Resident Life Association for Housing. And he is the public relations chair for the National Pan Hellenic Council for Black Free Horse on campus. And he is graduating next month with a BA in human resource professions. So we have grad student representation, undergrad, different majors, and schools. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Lance to explain more about what's been going on with student engagement and how we came here today. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Uh, so I know I recognize a lot of familiar faces from last year, um, but I got a lot of great feedback um, that I was able to kind of move forward through uh, throughout the year and use, uh, especially going into this event. Um, and so one of the big things is at the end of last year's event, um, one of the uh, faculty in attendance mentioned like, okay, this is great that we're having these conversations, but how can you talk to students too? And I was kind of stumped a little bit. And I was like, ah, shoot, I have to do that too. Um, 
And so I ended up uh, spending the summer planning an event uh, that I call the Maximizing College event. Um, and the whole idea behind it was essentially using the entire dialogue that we had at this event and bringing it to students. So that way it was truly a two-way conversation. Um, because one of the things that Dr. Moore and I talked about was what is faculty and staff's responsibility to get students engaged and what is the student's responsibility and kind of having this middle ground that we all agree, you know, is where we can meet at. And so um, one of the things that I focused on was as students, how can we help our teachers feel like we want to be there? Because I think that was some, some major feedback that I got here was that the teachers mm -hmm. feel like my students just they don't want to show up to class, like they don't want to get engaged, like it, it's hard to get them to do anything. And so kind of really addressing that directly with students and making sure that they know all the resources that we have available on campus and really encouraging them to, to take advantage of all those resources, but also just to stay on campus in general um, and get involved in extracurriculars to develop reports with their professor. I know that's, that's one thing that we talked a lot about last year was rapport. Um, and so just really maximizing that and making it easier on, on faculty as well. I know um, this year I had a planning meeting for this event and at the planning meeting, <laughs> one of the faculty brought up that in preparation for an exam, she got like a hundred emails in like a couple of days. Um, and that's something I didn't know as a student. Of course, most students wouldn't know that. Um, and so it really kind of puts into perspective of like, okay, maybe it would just make it a little easier on her if I just said, hey, after class and introduce myself so she knows who I am. Uh, additionally, um, we had about 50 people at the event, also some curious faculty stopped in, which is awesome. Um, and uh, it's also the presentation is on YouTube. Um, it got like 150 views, which I was pretty impressed with. Um, and so even students that weren't able to make it still kind of tuned in. Um, and then separate from that, uh, the, the biggest update is last year, I wasn't really involved in anything behind the scenes as far as administration, um, but now with the university adopting their new strategic plan, um, I've been very involved in advocating that student engagement be a part of that. And to clarify, when I say student engagement, I'm not just talking extracurricularly um, and as far as a campus life, but also in the classroom. And that's honestly where I focus most of my work is inside the classroom. And so... I was fighting really hard to try and make that a part. I wrote a resolution that was passed by the uh, Student Congress and also the University Senate saying that student engagement should be a part of it. Um, and because of that work, I am now a part of the Students uh, Senate Committee and also the uh, Academics Senate Committee. And I think what I've been most impressed with is, first of all, at the we've had our first meetings for all of them. And everybody is so excited to be there. Um, and you can tell that there's a desire to just do things a little bit differently. I know that at one of the meetings, one of the faculty pointed out that it feels like at Oakland, like we kind of stick to what we're used to. Um, and there's definitely a feeling of wanting to break from that mold, um, which is extremely appealing to me. Um, in fact, one of the most exciting things about today's event, other than just being able to facilitate this dialogue, um, is that so this past Saturday I went to a United Students Governance Conference um, and I led a breakout room and there was representatives from student governments from 10 of the 15 public universities and I did student engagement and what we do and no other school no other students are doing what we're doing here um, and so it's really exciting that once this is posted to YouTube and I'm able to reach out to all the connections that I made at that event that they're going to look at this event, and this is something that other universities are going to be replicating what we're doing instead of us following suit and trying to catch up with everybody else. Okay, perfect. You kept it very concise for all the, all the things that you have done. And that'll give us time to get input from everyone on a few questions to help get us going. Um, so the first question is, why is facilitating conversations on student engagement in the classroom necessary? And I'll add to this, having these conversations with students, between students and faculty. So we don't have to have everyone um, answer, but as many of you can answer. Yeah, I think I started. Yeah, go ahead. I think it establishes um, trust between faculty and instructors, and I also think it sets expectations. I think a lot of times um, we view engagement as the same thing as participation without recognizing that like 
you know, especially with like online settings and classrooms that um, students are going to participate and engage differently than in person. Uh, and also recognizing that it's a reciprocal process. Um, if the student is not going to be engaged and the professor is, there is going to be a very limited kind of capacity of engagement and vice versa with um, instructors. If they're super engaged and students want to go home after class and not be quite involved in the classroom or beyond, I think that impacts overall engagement, student engagement in the classroom. Um, so I think it's really important having that dialogue because a lot of times there's a lot of lack of um, communication between the two parties and of course that impacts student engagement. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I think student engagement is important because it, it shows that teachers care about their students' well-being and it shows when students know you care, they care about what they're getting. And, and like she said, it's a reciprocal process. It says so, and when students feel like their teachers care about what they are learning and cares about what type of people they are, what they can bring to the classroom, then when you have both the teacher and the students bringing something to the classroom and they're able to learn more and be more productive in class. So I think that's a, a important thing, especially with like these new generation of students coming in where they, they're going to require more engagement because most of half their high school years were cut by COVID and went fully virtual. And I don't think that, I don't think the effects of that have really been discussed about how students' social battery is very lower than what it used to be than like students who were not in the COVID time where they had fully virtual classes. And now since we're becoming more in-person and hybrid, so there's, we have to find new ways to be engaged with the students. Yeah, I think also to, to kind of second all of that and, and to go on, I think for me, uh, the reason why this conversation is necessary in the first place is first I, I wanted to identify <laughs> what I saw as the problems. And I think the lack of attendance in class, huge problem. Uh, I mean, I think we can all relate to once it's halfway through the semester, it's like you've never even met half your classmates. Like it's crazy. Um, and also to office hours. Um, for my maximizing college event, I did like a little survey that like six or seven faculty <laughs> filled out. Um, and, and it was about engagement, but also um, like what can students do to build rapport with their professors? And the most common answer was like, come to my office hours. And students never do that. I, I've done it like twice um, and not consistently. Um, and so it's like, why, why is that? Um, and so then I, I kind of dug a little deeper and my like analysis was that maybe students are feeling like they're not getting value from their classes. That it's like, oh, I can just look at the presentation. Like I don't need to be there, it's fine. Um, and so if students don't feel like there's value in actually attending in person or going to the office hours, then what can be changed so that they see the value again? And one of the things that I found in my research is that there's this disparity, or sorry, discrepancy between how students perceive that they learn best and how they actually learn best. Um, and I think that that's huge because it blew my mind once I learned that. And so Harvard did a study and they had uh, groups of students that were exposed to both passive learning, so traditional lecturing, uh, with a faculty member that was super smooth lecture, um, and then also uh, the active learning side of it. So when you have um, group work and you know game-based learning and, and that kind of stuff. And they asked the students that got exposed to, to both different uh, types of learning, which one do you think you learned best in? And the students were like, oh, the lecturing, for sure. Um, and then they went ahead and gave them examinations and the students performed better on the active learning. Um, and the reason for that, of course, uh, as, as the, um, the lead researcher said, is that deep learning is hard. And it's, it's way harder if, when one of you go ahead and ask me a question on the spot and I have to think of something real quick, mm -hmm. then if I can just listen to what you're saying and take notes and think, yeah, I'm learning that. Um, and so I think it's so important to be able to address that misconception among students, because I, when talking with faculty about this, I think one, one kind of common complaint with uh, when, when faculty are trying active learning is they're like, my students hate it. Like I get my feedback at, at the end of the year and my students are ripping into me. Um, and it's because students don't realize the value that they're getting. So I think that that's something incredibly important 
on day one to address. And in fact, I'm uh, trying to get in contact um, with the like welcome uh, events for incoming students. So that way we can hopefully start addressing people as soon as they walk into these doors so they can be a little bit more aware that that exists. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it definitely helps kind of having it in your syllabus um, and just going over it super quick so students know. Um, and, uh, and also just on top of that, I think, uh, yeah, go, go ahead, go ahead. Finish your sentence. Sure. Um, I, I was just going to say that also, um, you know, just, I think there, there's a disconnect, of course, in terms of how we live our lives. You know, it's, it, it's very different. And when I, when I talk with faculty, a lot of times they're like, I don't know what my students are thinking a lot of times. Um, and so really kind of making sure that you're on the same page and, and discussing with your students about what they care about. So, you know, the examples that you give in class are relevant and important to them, I think helps a ton with getting students to want to be there. So, well, yes, I actually I brought a printout of the study you just cited uh, with me. Um, so, I'm really excited that you guys are, are have organized this and that you organized the other events um, specifically because of what you said. Because, uh, so, so I've been advocating active learning uh, in the classroom since I came here uh, and I do a, a grad series each summer. Um, and um, the, the, the one, I think. One of the, the, the biggest challenges, and I think maybe the biggest challenge, is that when faculty do try active learning, there's a tendency to get a lot of pushback from students. And I think a lot of, so, so part of that is that faculty may not be aware that they're likely to get feedback. I know the first time I did it, you know, I, I, I went full board active learning my first semester, and I was shocked at, because I, I, I saw it, like how much students were learning. I was really, like I couldn't do this as a grad student. This is amazing, you know. And I got to the end of the semester, and I got feedback in my student emails that they didn't think they'd learn anything, and I was crushed. And uh, so then after that, like like half of what I do is is trying to convince them early on that this is going to be worth it, right? Like please, guys, please buy into this. Um, to have a, a group of students that are advocating that we use active learning, that are telling other students that this is valuable. That could be a real game changer because a, a lot of faculty, you know, they 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 dip their toes in a little bit and they get burned and well, that's a terrible analogy, but whatever. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, right. But but um, it, it's it's a real barrier to people being able to explore uh, using these other kinds of teaching uh, tools because we're almost entirely evaluated on our using student evaluations. I mean, our we at least have more senior faculty come in and visit your class a couple times uh, when you're under review. But other than that, it's all student evaluations. And if the students are punishing you for doing the thing that gets them to learn more, then we've got a lot of perverse incentives going on. So I, I, I would love to see there be more awareness among the student population that, you know, a, a, a faculty member who's doing things like Think pair share and stuff like you should be supporting that. I would love to see a like a short video that you that is done by students that we can either show the first day of class. I have a website for my intro classes, um, where you guys are literally seeing exactly this. Like, please buy into this. This is this is what you need. This is what we've done to be successful short and sweet but even that just might make a little bit of impact did you have yeah um i have a question for the anyone who wants to answer it for the students if um and then i have a, a request for my colleagues here if um i had a magic wand and i could tap each one of you what would the ideal classroom be for for you Tell us, I, what I've learned is that if I ask my students what they want, they'll tell me, and then we can work out something, and it works very well. And then for my colleagues, if you could just uh, tell them, uh, explain what you're teaching, what, you're made, what, uh, what your department is. Um, so I, I have a feeling teaching uh, in uh, mathematics might be very different. I'm a history professor. Uh, might be very different. And, I'm using active learning, so I'm, I'm on board with it. So, so I'll interject and then we will certainly answer that. So we are, just because I haven't given everyone an update. So we have 37 participants online, um, and then we have about 
and 15 in the room. So I think we have the full range here. We have humanities, social sciences, business. Um, we have about everyone. And um, professors Raffle and Hosh are in biology. So, so we definitely have the, the full mix of, of context here. And, and you waved the magic wand really well, because that's actually our next question is what does the optimal learning environment look like? Um, so I think before we get to that specifically, I'm wondering if there's any response here as far as what Lansford said and then what Professor Raffle just said about active learning. Because my struggle with that is active learning means so many different things. It can be class discussion. It can be group work. It can be um, think, pair, share, which is just that you think about something and then share it with others. So I guess I'm first wondering how these comments resonate with you because you're in different fields and writing and then in two different majors of business, so response? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I'd like to say I appreciate this conversation. Uh, I'm a little coming from a little different context. I'm, you know, in my 40s now. I graduated, my undergrad was uh, 2002. So it's been quite some time. I'm looking at education from a completely different angle now. Now it's like completely self-driven and I'm kind of hungry, you know, to fill in the gaps of what I've seen in life. But as an undergrad, and even before my undergrad, you wouldn't have been able to convince me of the value of class participation and engagement in class. <clears throat> I was very shy and any class where the teacher tried to force me to engage, I really, it gave me so much anxiety and I kind of wanted to run away. Uh, and it was kind of embarrassing. It was like a fear of like failing, fear of like looking stupid in front of a class. And somewhere I just kind of, through life experience, through traveling, and I myself got the chance to teach while I was in India. And I know what it's like to receive feedback because I was teaching teenage girls and they were very honest with me <laughs> about my teaching style. And it hurt. It hurt me really <laughs> But I'm so grateful because it helped me improve. You know, I saw, wow, I saw, like, I didn't realize I was an idiot. Yeah. So the feedback was really valuable for me uh, just to kind of incorporate and, and, and just learn. And feedback... It can go both ways because one of my professors here, so far I'm in my second semester, I've taken six classes and I would say of those six, two classes I'm pretty disappointed in. And one of the professors said he stopped giving homework and stopped creating interactions because he got feedback that students didn't like it. Mm -hmm. But here I was kind of hungry for, for knowledge and it was kind of offensive to me. So like who to believe, you know, when you give feedback, which feedback to listen to, which feedback to not listen to. And for me, those times when I've been uncomfortable have been the greatest learning opportunities. I never would have sought discomfort as a student. I wasn't a student because I really wanted to be there. It's just what people in my neighborhood and people in my family do. You know, like if I could skip class and still get an A, definitely I would have skipped class. <laughs> So one thing, like one of my teachers this semester or the previous semester, he made attendance mandatory and he made participation mandatory. And he shared that a lot of people don't like it. But I really appreciated that. From day one, he's like, I'm going to make you talk in class. You better read before you come. So it made me read. It made me be ready to participate. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, just because it makes someone uncomfortable doesn't mean it's valuable. And I understand I can... What, uh, what's your name? I'm Tom. Tom, okay. Nice to meet you. Yeah, no, I appreciate what you're saying because you want to and you know it's working, but then someone's, it's like, <laughs> who to listen to, you know? But in my experience, without discomfort, I don't grow. Without discomfort, I don't learn. So, excuse me, a very long-winded answer. <laughs> Did I yeah, I was going to piggyback off of um, what you said, just to, to your point, I think, there is a like a big fine line sometimes in active engagement where you want to get your students to engage, but you don't want them to feel like, oh, my teacher is bullying me into learning. And I think that's sometimes what students sometimes feel. But sometimes 
like you you didn't learn how to ride a bike until you fell off of it, and then you didn't want to ride, ride it, so you just learned how to ride the bike, so you didn't fall anymore. And I think sometimes students need like a little bit of a push sometimes because it's college is also for character development as well. So oh, when you start to encourage students and you get them to engage, they might not like it, but it's gonna eventually they're gonna see the benefit in it in the future. So I think that it might be a good point to move to George's question slash your question, which is what does the optimal learning environment look like? And then maybe I'll also add, add the next part in case that resonates more is what are barriers to the optimal learning environment? So you can take one or both. I think I'll start. I think for me as a writing major, I think community-based learning and any kind of learning that my professor is pushing me to extend my work beyond the classroom, beyond my grade, has been the best way to learn for me. Um, and that is that includes me doing work that is that isn't just limited to me submitting it for a grade. Uh, that does include me uh, collaborating with a professor and being involved. And I think that maybe is like another conversation about how professors are willing to uh, like go the extra mile and be engaged with their students beyond the classroom. That sometimes involves beyond class hours and beyond office hours to collaborate with their um, students. Um, but I also think. To me, that has been the best way to learn because that doesn't make my learning very transactional and like one way of I do something, I perform and I get a grade. I'm able to, um, again, like be involved in whether it's like my college community or with, whether it is like beyond uh, like the local community, anything that is community-based learning to me has been very beneficial. So just extending that work and engagement and finding what your students what your students are interested in and what they like doing. I think while, while you were talking, Andrew, I was thinking about how each student has different priorities. And guess what? Sometimes students are going to come to the classroom wanting their A and not wanting to be involved. And I think sometimes recognizing that you can't necessarily change that, but also knowing that your other students are hungry for more and they want to present and they want to collaborate with you. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think um, service learning programs in particular, um, I'm a big fan of. Um, I think it's also important to, of course, there has to be balance. There's certain classes that, you know, it's, it's not necessarily doable to have that kind of dynamic. Um, I think a good example is one of my Spanish classes. Um, my professor took advantage of extra credit by saying, hey, you want to go out into the community and practice your Spanish and write a little bit about it? I'll give you extra credit. So that way it's no more extra effort for her. She doesn't have to go anywhere. It's just, I guess, the extra effort of, you know, reading the, the little uh, page or two that we write about it. Um, but I think that that helps to provide a little bit of balance too if, if it's a little bit intimidating of like, okay, why well, I'm not going to take my entire class somewhere. Um, I think also in addition to that, um, that one of the conversations that I've had, um, and I think very similar to what Andrew brought up, about how students that, that don't want to get engaged and you can create this resentment um, if it's like, well, it's a part of your grade now. Um, and so the conclusion that I've come to um, is, is that I think that it is worth it um, putting students in a little bit of an uncomfortable spot. Of course, making yourself available that if it's like, if you feel like you absolutely not cannot share in class, like email me. Like I, I think a lot of my professors do a very good job of making sure that students know that if they just don't feel like it's in their capabilities, there is a way out. They can, you know, figure something out to do. Um, but for, for the majority of students, um, they're not necessarily being a choice um, because I think it creates a little bit of a, a cascade effect. That And it's very similar to if um, you were to provide, like, as an alternate assignment. Um, one idea that I've been thinking about is if you have, like, the theory, like, okay, you want to do your accounting project like everybody else does, fine. Um, but if you want to go to three accounting clubs, and write a little excerpt on it. That's like the, the application. Like, sure, that, that would count for the same same amount. That it's like once you get students to get engaged one time, that that might be enough for them to recognize the value of getting engaged a second time. And then all of a sudden, they're kind of taking it on their own. And now you're not having to sit there and say, all right, who wants to go next? Because you're starting to create a, a classroom culture um, that exists. And, um, and when that classroom culture exists, um, then <clears throat> students are, are making friends and they're networking with their peers. I think uh, one thing that I brought up last year a lot, it's like, I don't know any of my classmates. It's depressing. Um, and I do my best 
to, to put my foot down, or put down, my, uh, my phone down, <laughs> um, to put my phone down and, um, and just be available if there's any of my other classmates that want to talk with me. Um, but most of them are just busy looking at their phones because they're scared. And so when there's the kind of environment where it's like, hey, like introduce yourself to your neighbor. Hey guys, why don't we just go ahead and, and switch spots here and go sit next to somebody that you don't know. Um, that, that creates like that classroom culture where people start feeling, you know, more comfortable sharing. Um, and then it's not a matter of, of fighting through the discomfort anymore because you've created this classroom culture that just keeps things going and going and going and going. Okay, so I wanted to read a comment online and then we have one question online. Um, this is from Michelle Knox. As an upcoming master's graduate, Dr. Roberta Rea, academic advising, is a great example of active learning. In the classroom, she included groups, games, panels, presentations, etc. For online, she included her overview of the topic in video form for us to review at any time. All students participated, even when uncomfortable, because she validated our ideas with positive feedback. Most of all, she showed compassion and met us where we mm. were at. Um, so, Sam Stroy, you had a question online. Go ahead and unmute. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, one of the things I've, so the biggest problem that we have when it comes to engagement um, comes from a lot of our production courses. I I think there's like a double-edged sword for courses like that. They're less theoretical, right? Because with, with more theoretical cl uh, classes, um, I found it a lot easier to get students engaged because I can you know, we can stop and talk about things and the conversation leads to personal disclosure of things that could help illustrate uh, concepts. But I think when it comes to uh, courses where you learn a, a, just a, you know, a rote skill, one of the problems I found was that a lot of the students had taken the previous course and viewed it as just something they had to do in order to get to the current course. And so there was a lot of skills that they were just missing or had forgotten. Um, and so I spent a lot of time effectively reteaching intro courses to students in the advanced course. And then the second thing, you know, which takes away from time for, for leading to other forms of engagement. And I think also the second problem is I, I, I tend to see a lot of students sort of expecting it as if I was a, um, uh, like a like a coding boot camp, right? So I'll I'll teach code. Uh, I'll teach uh, not coding. I'll teach like how to do video editing, for example, or audio editing. And then the response I would get was like, "Well, okay, how do I get the A? How do I get the A? How do I get the A?" And okay, well, here's what you could do better. It's the well, why didn't I get the A? Why didn't I get the A? <laughs> right? And so there, it, it ends up being this sort of transactional thing. And I've and I've and I'm telling you, I've. I played video games with my students to try to break the ice, right? Literally said, hey, I'll be on Steam. Here's my Steam ID. Come play and get to know me so we can build that rapport. And during that time, I can tell you about, you know, how audio or editing or how all that stuff works, right? You know, I just want to get to know you. I've had one student in the 10 years I've been here take me up on that during the pandemic. Um, that's it. You know, I... um. Uh, the so time is one of the issues that I, I feel like we're dealing with with times when there's like that norm of transactionalism has taken root so much so that you know they're not really remembering stuff from the past but, and then the second thing is that as I'm teaching them I've encouraged them to do stuff as groups I've made it assignments and I get this pushback all the time and I hear you I hear you guys saying that there are for all the pushback that I'm receiving, they're probably a majority, right? Let's just say a vast majority who do enjoy that sort of group work and stuff like that. Let's just make that assumption. That's true, then great. I, I'm doing something uh, good, but it doesn't take from the fact that we get that pushback from the students who aren't happy and then there is this larger institutional culture at the university that says, keep your students happy, keep your students happy, right? So I'm sort of caught between two different 
impulses. I mean, it's even, you know, the department, in order to try to create student engagement, even used to throw pizza parties every Friday. We called it first Fridays every month. The department would buy like tons of pizzas and snacks and stuff like that, invite all the students. I've given extra credit to come let me feed you for free. <laughs> and nobody came. It became a point where we're like, I'm sick of eating the same pizza and talking to the people down my hallway. So I, I don't know what to do. I mean, it's just like, do I, you know, I, I don't know what to do. So I'm sorry. It's sort of like a frustration that I'm like, help. I think I think it, it touches on a lot of things that faculty experience in different ways. The idea of the, the tension between, oh, you should already know this, um, and maybe reteaching things, grade transaction, what motivates students, how time is involved. So with those issues summed up, I'm wondering what your reactions are to what uh, Professor Story just said. Yeah, Angela. Uh, just something very... Uh, just one point I picked up on is, uh, is there a difference between keeping your students happy and helping them be successful? Okay, yes, we want them to be happy. We want them to be comfortable. We don't want, we don't want anyone to be very uncomfortable, but keeping them happy, is it like, is our goal to make them as successful as they can in their career and in, in their life, or is it to make them comfortable and happy? Obviously, happiness we want, but sometimes we have to go through that. So it's just it's just a question that came to mind. And I would I would also like, if you don't mind, to go back to the, the previous question and just uh, share about what I am looking for in my professors, even in university, a lot of times I was looking for mentorship more than anything. I was looking for someone that I could look up to, someone that I could learn from, either both in life and in my career. And right now, a big thing that I'm that I'm interested in is like, what exactly do I want to do? You know, I've invested so many years in a certain area volunteering with nonprofits, and I'm just kind of making a shift in my life right now. And so it's a big question. So meeting people who've been there, meeting people who have the experience, who have the industry knowledge, who have the life experience. And I had, I don't have that. And many students don't have that. And it's like, I would just like to imbibe that. And a lot of times, like, it, it's, it's almost hilarious because it seems like both sides want the same thing, but at least to some extent, you know, but where's the gap, you know? It's like, a professor may want students to come to office hours. Students may want that mentorship. Maybe they're not openly saying it, but somewhere inside, I, I feel there is an interest in wanting some mentorship and how to bridge that gap. And excuse me, the gentleman who shared online, if I'm deviating from your point, uh, but you, you know, know like... <laughs> no, you're no, it's fine. I I, I can answer that. Um... So when it comes to students who do want that mentorship, right? I, I do have students come, but there's a difference between one or two students every two or three semesters who say, hey, can you take a look at this? Hey, can I tell you about what I've been doing? What are your opinions? How do I get, you know, further my career? Yada, 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 right? The, the, that does happen, but there's a, I think there's a gap structurally between that and, a larger class, right? You know, so then what is my, where is my duty, right? Is my duty then to the two or three students? Of course. But then what about the other students who are also my pupils who are saying, I just want my A, man, leave me alone. <laughs> you know, stop trying to be cool and hang out with me on, on a video game. Well, I, I, okay, you tell me what you want from me. Uh, other, other responses? Um, I think when it comes to like the, uh, speaking to the point where you said uh, students need already need, so you should already do this when it comes to class, I think that's going to be an even bigger problem as it's going to continue to be like a bigger problem. And I think the best way to combat that is really just having like an eye for it. Um, I've had professors where they're, they'll like, and 
schools, they have something called, it's called intervention specialists. Um, or they see a student that's struggling with something is because they're either missing a key point in their education that they didn't get. So like you went, you're in, you're in calculus, but you really missing those key algebra points that you really didn't learn correctly. So now you're trying to catch up to a subject that you really don't even have like the the foundation to even go into yet. So I think office hours is the kind of the best way to combat that or like emailing us and like, hey, I noticed that you're maybe struggling with this part uh, of the class and you're struggling with this type of these type of concepts. Would you be willing to come to my office hours to maybe brush up on some skills or you I know some professors are now they'll include like uh, videos inside of their Moodles where like it goes back to those old key concepts that students need to learn for the current class and just to get them like a refresher. Because um, usually professors at the beginning of the semester, you guys always do like a refresher of like probably what the previous class before or your class was just to get students refreshed on what it is. Is um, I think one of the I think you know, does the act of learning where she not just is trying to connect with students like hey how was your day it's more like what's important to the students so in that class there was a lot of common students a lot of stat students so she connected the things to the class by what she would teach was real life issues and she would say okay this is for this company and if you look into this come this could really take your career far if you know how to do this certain skill or if you know how to use this certain program. Um, and really keeping her, well, keeping her class up to the times, basically. Because I think with to students and what we're starting to see is that they're not seeing like the value in their education as they used to. So when you connect like their careers and what they want to go into to the actual concept of what they're learning, it's Better if they feel more, they'll be more willing to engage because this can actually help them. Like we talked about wanting a mentor that could help them in his career. Um, connecting your class to how they could possibly implement this into their careers could be a good way to get students more engaged. Because if I don't like stats, I'm an HR major and I don't <laughs> like stats, but she made it engaging mm -hmm. and it made me want to learn stats because if I learn this skill, I know I can take this to a job. Be like, I know this skill, I know how to do. PSPP, I know how to find the regression and all of that. So, and then it helps you, like, it helps you, the student, visualize how the subject can connect to their own lives. So, lucky for you, Sammy Grace. It's here online. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, sorry, I yeah, what we've covered, I think to me, and I hope I addressed that question. Um, Briefly, I think there's a gap between our grading methods, but also the way that students view instructors. Um, my my colleagues who were talking on Zoom the other day about hierarchy and feeling that your instructor is superior than you. I think when I think of the connections that I find through with my professors, once these two things are aligned um, or, or organized in an appropriate manner, where I'm not graded too harshly, but I'm also not graded not so harshly. I, I think I also want to acknowledge that like, no, not not taking grading seriously and just kind of like winking it and just listening on discussion sometimes cannot be helpful, but also not going on to the extreme of like being super harsh when you're grading your um, students, whether that is having a high percentage of tests. I'm a writing major, so I'm being graded my writing quality. But also I think, um, and I know that's not the case for everyone, but Lance shared an amazing um, example the other day with me how Sometimes instructors view their students the same level as them. And I can tell you from my own professors, when that is the case and the dynamic, I feel more encouraged and more eager to be involved, to not only be engaged in the class, but to want to talk to them, to want to like get to know them. And then like it's amazing how like naturally you become interested to work with them again beyond the classroom. So I think how can we bridge that gap where you don't see your students as inferior and you recognize what they bring to the table and the knowledge that they bring is also valuable for your other students as well. I just wanted to bring up a small point. I think to your point of how to bridge that gap, I think student SI classes are a good way because sometimes I've, what I've noticed is 
students have more engagement in their SI than in their actual classroom. Yes. So I think if professors probably like spoke to like their supplemental instructors, it'll help them like see, okay, where is the where, what are they talking to you about? What mm -hmm. are what is what are their issues or where do they where are their issues at in the classroom or what do you think I could do to help them catch up to the to the subject or catch up in class or be more engaged? Because there what SI does is it's a student teaching their fellow peers. So they feel a more it's they have more of a connection to that student. It's not that superiority. Over, over them because they're right they're more base level with each other so they feel more eager to engage with somebody that actually has been through the class and has been in their position and also they're not making an assumption about what they are bringing and what they should have known and they're not judging them and i think um kind of thinking of like dni and the assumption that we have uh, about our students i think is really important because once we make those assumptions and have those expectations that's when you kind of have them run away and not want to be engaged and connected with you so I want to go back to uh, some things that Sam said. Uh, I was taking uh, some notes here. So I know, Sam, that you, rec uh, you mentioned transactionalism and kind of this idea of how to get past pushback, um, because it sounds like you, you feel like you're making yourself very available to your students and your, and your students are just repeatedly saying, no, thanks, I'm good. <laughs> um, and so kind of I had, I had a few thoughts on that, um, because one of the reasons why I got so involved in student engagement is I felt um, like there wasn't actually a desire to learn anymore for my classmates. There was a desire to get a piece of paper when you're done with your college experience, um, but there wasn't a desire to learn. And so um, that, that desire to learn, uh, I think was replaced by this extrinsic motivation to, to get good grades so you can get that piece of paper. So how can you get back to that intrinsic motivation? Um, and uh, one uh, community that I'm a part of is the ungraded community. Um, I think uh, it's really interesting thing to explore where, and I know we have some representatives in here from the ungrading uh, community, but um, basically the idea of ungrading is there are still grades at the end of class, um, but students are a lot of times self-grading um, and it's more project-based. Um, and obviously you'll have to um, you know, adapt it to each class. Um, but the interesting thing that I found that uh, a lot of faculty will share kind of the same experience that in the beginning of it, students are like, come on, but what is my grade? Um, but then like after it gets a few weeks in, then students start to enjoy it way more. And so I think it kind of gets to your point of how you get past that pushback. And when you know that on the other side, once you get past those first four, five, six weeks or whatever it is where students are adapting and, and a little uncomfortable, um, that they are going to start recognizing the value, um, that it's definitely, you know, definitely worth it. Um, I think also uh, it's important to recognize how important day one is. Day one, you have so much power um, because every student is there. And it's the only time where all of your students are there. And so that is like, that is your stage and opportunity to be able to build that rapport and, and create that sense of transparency about like, you know, I think even sharing some of your frustrations with like, hey guys, like I want your feedback. I'm a big fan of student surveys and getting to know your classes um, because I think it also makes me feel heard as a student when my teachers ask questions like, is there anything going on outside of class that you think would be important for me to keep in mind? Like it, it's so nice that, and, I, and I think that it, it goes a long way in developing rapport early. And so I think taking something like that um, really helps, you know, kind of, kind of, you read your room a little bit more um, and, and I think sharing the, the frustrations that you have about feeling like, you know, students aren't using you. So like, what, what can you do, you know, so they, it, it can bridge that gap, um, that even though I don't think it's going to have to change anything from you per se, um, that students, I think it, it humanizes you a lot more and, and really feels like to Mina's point, like everybody's on the same level. Um, because I think it's possible that students might perceive, like, well, I'm not playing video games with my, like, they're my teacher. <laughs> um, and so it's like, is that is that a reasonable way to look at it? I don't think so. Um, but I, I think I think that definitely bridging that gap through that rapport on, on day one can go a long way. So in the interest of time, I'm putting something in the 
chat to get us going. So I'm going to pose a question and an invitation, I suppose. So um, Lance and I have been talking about how to continue to cultivate faculty, student, collaboration as far as engagement in the classroom and what it looks like. So first as the invitation, I am going to pass around a form here and I've put a Google Doc in the chat for those who are online that if you would be interested in hearing what's going on, if, if we develop opportunities for more of these collaborations, first to just hear what we plan on and then maybe we can ask you how to be involved as that comes together. So first, if you're interested, um, please write your name and email so that we can keep you in the loop. And then I will, I'll present this as an actual question. <laughs> okay, so if we think about what a student-faculty partnership like this could look like, you know, to Nina's point, I was hearing, you know, that we're, we're building this thing together, we're building this environment together, um, what could we see as a successful program or, or what would be helpful to both students and to instructors about such a continued partnership? What kind of feedback would be helpful for you to get from students, maybe on a more regular basis? Can I just say uh, along, um, yeah, so along the lines of what we've been sharing, uh, just about being on the same level and kind of humanizing the professor. A situation like this where we're sitting together at the table and having open conversations, I feel is a really great starting point. If there can be more opportunities like this, like I really appreciate the fact that all of you have come. If there can be more opportunities in any way, in any context, just to come together as equals and just hear, just listen, ask questions of each other. I think it, I think we can learn so much. Yeah, I actually have a question of the student panel. Um, how do you guys feel about teachers being involved with your extracurricular activities? Like, is it weird? Like a Tuesday night they had the drag show and I ran into like <laughs> five or six of my students there and I thought that was really fun. And I don't think they expected to see me there. Um, but how how is that written for you guys? Like like uh, Sam was talking about like, oh, play video games with me and nobody did like, is like, how does it feel when we are involved with you guys outside of classroom activities? Like sure, like in the class, but how does it fly when we're coming to your events and coming to your shows? And how does that feel for you guys? And is that a good thing or a bad thing? I think it's a good thing. I think um, on the, the student side, it's good to see like, oh, my teacher is out and about as a person, not a professor. <laughs> I, don't know. Yeah. I think it, it does bring up that humanized point. We have, okay, they have similar interests to me. They interested in what the student body is doing. But um then it comes my concern is um I don't I would I would hate for teachers to feel like it's an obligation that they have to do it. Because work-life balance is still a thing. Right. I would hate for professors to then start to resent it. Like, oh, I got to do all this plus work, and I still got to go home to my family or what mm -hmm. I do in my personal life. Like, I would, it's it's definitely an initiative that a professor would have to take if they really like, wanted that engagement in their classroom. Um, I think it is worth a shot to go, like, to one where, like, their students may be going when, or, like, and see what events are happening on campus. You, you can probably tell your students, look, I'll be here. But if you guys are going out, I'll, I'll see you guys there. I, I'm in directly in the drag show, so I'll, if I'll be there if you guys are. Mm -hmm. I think it's very empowering. I, I feel like I am a huge advocate of being involved and again, like making sure that I am showing up for my professors and they also show up for me. And I think recognizing that it should be organic, right? You don't want to force your student to hang out with you or to develop a relationship with you if they are not interested in that. And I think for me, it happens very naturally and like you know, quickly you realize that two parties, you know, that she's going to go for my conference or vice versa. Um, I think it's very empowering because to me, I think um, I also realize that they advocate on my behalf and that is very empowering. If that is in a um, meeting or that is for a uh, opportunity for me to participate in, for me to be involved in, I think that shows that they are, um, again, like being an advocate for me, all because they show up for an event that I was a part of. 
So yeah, it's very empowering. But is it also awkward? <laughs> I like <laughs> the so. Sam's point. Like, I think that's the concern sometimes, you know. Probably at first, but <laughs> it's like like we brought up earlier, like you being uncomfortable helps growth. I think it's uncomfortable and awkward because uh in high school, that's not a thing, right? I mean, they tell you, do not add me on social media, which I know that is a controversial topic. Do not like talk to me with my colleagues. But I think when we come to college, we realize that like they are people with interests and they are, have a life and they have a family. So it's like kind of being open to that. They're also a human and they also happen to be a professor. I think I think I had the opposite experience um, in high school. I would see my teacher at events all the time. Like I have some teacher posted like, clubs and stuff and they will come to like events after schools it was a teacher that that was like the the head coach of a dance team and the cheer team um so i think i think that's kind of like i was in one of my first points where i talked about like the differences between like a high school teacher and a college professor um is the level of seriousness um i think sometimes that's where students probably lose their, that engagement it's like okay, this is college, I have to be about business here. Mm -hmm. um, versus like in high school, like, okay, I'm learning, I'm actively learning, I'm engaged with my, my teacher, I'm engaged with my students. Students aren't as engaged with each other in college as they are in high school, because they're not seeing them like on a regular basis, <laughs> eight hours of the day. You might see like your classmates two hours off the day, hey, and every uh, once a week, and that's not like a, you, sure, you get to know them, you start recognizing faces, but it's not really, if the, if you're not in the classroom doing something that actively engages the students, it's, then it's still going to be awkward and students won't participate because they don't know each other. I mean, you know, people are still kind of like self-conscious about what others think about them. So in the classroom setting of like college, people are less willing to engage because of like that, okay, everybody's like fresh. I don't want to come off as like the, the class clown here. So it, 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 would, it, would, it wouldn't fly college so that's what high school teachers preach oh they're not going to take that in college you get yourself to, you got to get yourself together and <laughs> i think that's what students especially me coming to college i was like okay i have to really get myself together this is professional so don't ask questions i still already know this and i think that's a big problem as well students feel like they should already know this so if they raise their hand to ask questions about something then they're going to feel they're going to feel outside inadequate. Uh, inadequate yeah they're going to feel inadequate about their class subjects they don't feel like they should be there because they don't know the material so we have about two minutes left so i want to prioritize the students maybe having the last word if there's anything really short that you would like to share yeah i just wanted to jump in super quick and uh, as everybody's starting to leave i know i have a one o'clock class but um i know a lot of us have one o'clock classes oh, okay. I, I think i think my teacher might be in the zoom so it's fine <laughs> um, but thank you guys so much for coming it makes me so happy to have this many people um that share the same mission that i do um obviously this is not a one-off event even though we end at one o'clock today this is never ending uh, I, want, I want I want this to keep going. Um, so thank you guys. I, I can't thank you enough. I mean, I really appreciate this opportunity. I feel like I agree with everything that the other student panelists have shared, especially on the the topic of connecting with teachers, the teachers being approachable, being authentic, being human. Uh, that just that my willingness to listen to someone if they make themselves vulnerable, if they show that they make mistakes, if they show that they're not higher than me, I'm so much more willing to listen to that person and just sit with that person and, and follow their instructions. Like I do it anyway, but sometimes I do it with a grudge. <laughs> sometimes I do it joyfully, like I like this person and I just want to do what they say, you know? So yeah. Uh, I mean same point. I think to me it's all about student <laughs> success and student goals. And um, I think I said this earlier, but like recognizing that it's all about the students. And I know sometimes we are teaching uh, topics that we so care about and we are passionate about, and they we can get them to be as excited as us. But recognizing that each one of my students is here for a different reason, and how can I support that without uh, imposing anything or judging that? And sometimes, you know, they they are going to settle for not an A, and that's okay too. And sometimes they want to be obsessed with you and play video games with you. So just kind of finding that balance between both.
Well, thank you very much. And uh, Lance, your teacher said class starts in one minute. So. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, for being here.